as the title says, what I'm going to do is run you through uh, the uh, analysis tools. And uh, Sino already introduced uh, the logic of these tools and actually went through uh, some of the uh, specifics. So what do these tools do is process uh, data that you might have generated uh, from querying the IDB or you might have generated in your own lab or by some other uh, uh, methodology. Uh, so uh, there is a, uh, as Sino uh, described, a broad range of applications. We have uh, tools that look at population coverage, uh, episode conservation, and so forth. And the first tool that I'm going to uh, discuss in a little bit more detail is the one that has to do with uh, population coverage. So what does this do? It's basically uh, calculates the fraction of individuals in a given population of known HLA uh, 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 frequencies uh, that are predicted, inferred, to bind or to uh, respond to uh, a given uh, set of epithets. So uh, this uh, is based on the fact that, as you all know, uh, different HLA types are found. There are many different HLA types. The frequency of each different HLA type is variable. And to make things more complicated, the specific HLA frequencies are different in different populations. Uh, and so how do we uh, calculate that? Uh, obviously, we do need. Uh, Uh, HLA genotypic frequencies in order to perform this calculation. And we need to know for our epitope or our set of epitope, what do they do? So this tool can work at the level of binding. So if you say I have 10 epitopes and I know that epitope number one binds DR1 but not DR3 and DR4 and not DR5, or you might know from your patient population that that particular epitope is eliciting a T-cell response in people that are DR4 but not DR5 or DR7 and not DR6 or whatever. Uh, as was alluded earlier, the, uh, uh, babe, can I, does this work? Oh, right. Uh, the uh, data in terms of the HLA genotypic frequencies is not maintained by BIDB, but we uh, import that or use the uh, data that is uh, uh, stored and maintained by the HLA frequency.net. So, and, uh, and this is essentially, it's, a, it's not it actually a, a very difficult calculation. This is very tedious because it's basically a, a binomial uh, distribution you need from the frequency back calculate the genotype frequencies and then uh, it's the good old Hardy Weinberg uh, equation for those of you that uh, remember your genetic uh, years which is uh, uh, it can be calculated so but in this particular example uh, we uh, imagine to have 11 different uh, MHC uh, class two uh, restricted epitopes, and these are promiscuous binders in the sense that uh, they might bind uh, multiple HLA types, but it's not always the case. It doesn't matter, but the tool works regardless. Um, and this is the output that uh, after you enter your data, which again is the uh, list of the reactivity of each of the epitopes for the different HLA types, this is the output that you uh, receive. And so uh, let me walk you through uh, the, the output. So you can have it either as a, uh, was, did I skip? A, yeah. Uh, I wanted to point out that there is a, a, a menu from which you can select the uh, data for your particular uh, 
population. This is also actually, at a, it's a fine point, but uh, there are database uh, uh, that compile HLA frequency according to ethnicity. And there are compilations regarding uh, that compile according to geographic location. And that makes a difference in the sense that, for example, you might have that if you uh, say uh, put in the, uh, I want the HLA frequency of, uh, I don't know, uh, Colorado or uh, the, in the ethnicity, you would get the frequency of HLAs of the American Indian that are uh, where in, in Colorado. While if you are, want to have a vaccine, maybe you might be interested in uh, what is the response frequency of the people that live in Colorado. So the, the, the ethnicity is not the same as geographic location. And this is, the, the data is on geographic location. Uh, and it's updated because obviously people do uh, survey of HLA types all the time. So uh, what is the output here? And so here you have uh, in the table uh, format, uh, this imaginary example, we selected North Africa, so there is data actually in uh, the, uh, the um, MHC net uh, the, for Algeria, uh, Ethiopia, Morocco, Sudan, and Tunisia. And what are the output variables? So one is the uh, coverage, and the coverage is defined what fraction of that population would bind or respond to at least one peptide. And so in this particular case, you see there is a, a difference because the HLA frequency are different, but on average, you would say that 76.9% of individuals bind or uh, respond to at least one epitope. And the standard deviation of that is uh, whatever is here, which I can't read. Uh, the other variable is the average hit in the sense that on average, granted that 80% of the people recognize at least one epitope, but how many people recognize one or two or three or four or five? So on average, this, in this population, the average individual recognizes seven epitopes. In fact, this point is uh, easier to see in the uh, graphical output. So, uh, we said that 76.9% uh, is the fraction of individual recognize at least one epitope. So what is the fraction of individual that recognize no epitope? Of course, it's 100 minus 76, which is uh, 20, 5, whatever, right? So then you see that some people recognize two, and then there is this blip here, and then this other blip here. So it's not a normal distribution, but it needs to be calculated. You might argue, how uh, is it possible that we had 11 epitopes and some people recognize 22 epitopes? Well, because we are heterozygote, most of the people. Uh, so you have two uh, hits uh, are possible in your uh, genome. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the PC90 uh, is uh, another way of expressing the uh, population coverage, which goes back again from uh, uh, studies that were done for epitope uh, vaccine and uh, whatever, which says, well, what, uh, how, how many epitopes will 90% of the people uh, in this population recognize? And this is about a little bit less than one. Let's switch to a, a different uh, tool, the epitope conservancy analysis. So here again, the tool uh, operates on a set of epitopes that uh, is provided by the user, it might be coming from a, a IDB search or from your own data. And the tool calculates the degree of conservancy within a given set of protein sequence, which also needs to be provided. Now, uh, the issue, and this is an ad adjustable sequence identity threshold. And what does it mean? So 
again, you need to define what does it mean to be conserved. So uh, you might say, you know, for my uh, taste, as long as uh, this epitope is at least 80% conserved, I call it conserved, or 70% or 90%. So you need to define what does it mean to be conserved. And then you will say, I have a set of 100 sequences, and I want to know this particular epitope, out of these 100 sequences, how many times is conserved 70% or more, or 80% or more, or 100%. So you can pick the threshold that operationally you define as being conserved, and then the tool will calculate what fraction of the sequences will uh, have that level of conservation. So in this particular case, I think uh, it's a, a bunch of Ebola uh, uh, epitopes that are provided, and these are the, oh no, it's Lassa. It's Lassa or Ebola? Uh, the protein sequences are uh, provided, and then you have the results here. And so you, you see the, uh, these are the different epitopes that were submitted with their sequence. Uh, and then in the uh, set of sequences was submitted says how many times this, uh, each epitope was, uh, in this particular case, for example, we said 100% conserved. So you see that uh, uh, some epitopes are remarkably conserved. In 63 out of 64 sequences, this epitope was found 100% conserved. Uh, other uh, epitopes may be less conserved. So this particular uh, epitope here was conserved in 42 out of 64 sequences, 100% exactly conserved, right? So uh, that doesn't tell you what is the degree of uh, homology or conservancy of the ones that were not conserved. So 42 we know they're identical, so that's the end of the discussion. It's 100% there. But what about the ones that are not conserved? How similar or dissimilar were they? And so if you click on the, on the thing there that says go, you will get the breakdown and will show you that, yes, even though there were uh, many sequences that were not 100% conserved, well, I mean, the, the, the uh, identity level was not that bad in the sense that, you see, in most cases, the sequences were not 100% conserved, where in reality had only one amino acid substitution, in some cases, uh, two. So this gives you a, a drill down, more detail on how much is this conserved. Uh, then there is the epitope cluster tool. And uh, so, as Sino was saying, you might have a set of epitopes and you want to know, uh, do they belong together? Are they, for example, essentially variations of the same epitope or antigenic region uh, or, yeah, and so forth. So we have uh, uh, implemented three different versions that uh, depending on the application and depending on your taste, you might select one or the other. Uh, and spoiler alert, we recommend one of them, <coughs> and I'll uh, show you why in a second. Um, and as here we're saying, you might want to generate epitope pools, for example. So say you have uh, a lot of sequences from different dengue isolates. You want to group them and then uh, make a, a, a consensus or representative because you don't want to test 100 different peptides, or you might want to make overlapping peptide sets spanning a region or whatever. So what are the three different clustering approaches? First one is all connected peptides in a cluster. So you say, I want to group all peptides that have 70% homology. Great. The drawback of that is that this connects all the peptides. So in the case where you would have, say, a set of overlapping peptides, 15 mers overlapping by 12, spanning a 
thousand residues of a protein, it will be a single gigantic cluster because epitope one, which overlaps of 12 amino acids with uh, epitope two, those two will be in a cluster. Then the third epitope will still have the same level of homology. And so you basically walk down and at the end of the day, you will have in the same pool, in the same cluster, peptides that have <laughs> absolutely no homology to each other. Uh, the other approach, but this is not worthless. I mean, it's for some application, it's fine. Uh, this one is a fully interconnected uh, cluster, so clicks. And this one instead dictates that all the members of that cluster must satisfy the level of homology to all other peptides. So that basically, if you say this is 70% homology and has 10 peptides in it, each one of the 10 has 70% homology to the remaining nine, which is good, but the drawback is that this is a non-redundant classification in the sense that the same peptide may be found in multiple clicks. And then the recommended method is an extension of this, but it breaks out the, uh, 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 the clusters and so that uh, uh, each peptide is represented in only one uh, uh, cluster, but avoiding uh, many of the uh, instances of the uh, clicks being uh, in multiple clusters. So let's see how it works, shall we? Okay, here are some peptides that have funny sequences. Uh, trapper, clapper, snapper, wrapper time, daytime, anytime, per time. Uh, <clears throat> these actually could be, if you want to make these peptides, you can synthesize them because I, I did it. it, it be, the thing will not allow you to put in a Q, for example, because Q is not an amino acid. So all of these are legitimate peptides. <laughs> uh, and let's imagine that this set of peptides, we want to cluster them, right? Okay, so if we, okay, we put them in uh, twice, nice days, ice and cedar. Uh, we go to step two, uh, we select uh, the, uh, I, um, identity threshold and we select the method we want to use and off we go. And so as I was saying here, you see there's a, a, a uh, I also put in the over peptide because I could not resist because it's not a word, but it's the over 323339 uh, that is widely used. So you see, uh, you have these different uh, clusters and these are things that do not uh, cluster with anything else. But the point I want to make is that in this cluster, trapper, timeless, whatever, includes trapper and timeless, even though trapper and timeless per se do not have, you would not put them in the same cluster, but because of this transitive nature of uh, this methodology, they end up in the same cluster. So if we use instead the click method, you have a problem that wrapper time ends up, and many others, end up in multiple clicks. So that this, it's a, uh, well, this may be fine uh, if you're, I don't know, doing antibody uh, uh, cross inhibition of monoclonal antibodies or something, but uh, another application is not. So the, the cluster break methodology, uh, looks at the level of uh, uh, homology between the different uh, peptides and breaks them. And you see here it has this uh, more stringent. And the other thing that uh, for all methodologies you can do, you have the, uh, either the table or the graphic visualization and then you can actually uh, move over and uh, it will show you each peptide uh, what is the sequence, and you see that there is the, the sequence, the, the, the relationship, the interconnection of the homology with the peptides. Uh, next tool is rate. Uh, <clears throat> so this tool aims to uh, infer or uh, determine HLA restriction 
and it's, this is not a uh, unequivocal assignment, at least with a size of data sets that uh, uh, usually are tested in the immunological experiments, but is meant as a way to restrict the potentialities, the potential restrictions, and then uh, to do experiments with uh, single HLA transfected cell lines or what have you. So the, the, the logic of this tool is simple. While there are 3,000 different HLA types, if I see responses uh, to a set of peptides in 30 patients uh, that have asthma that I tested, well, it can't possibly be that there are thousands of different HLAs because at the most, each person can express eight HLAs. <laughs> so if there are 30 uh, people expressing eight, eight uh, well, it's some number, eight times 30, what? Uh, <coughs> 240 different HLA types. So that already narrows down from thousands to, to hundreds. The next question is, if now uh, you see a response of that peptide in three people and no response in 27 other people, obviously the restriction element we might not know, but it has to be one HLA that they express not only in the population, but it's expressed in the people that respond. The next thing that uh, you can then reason is that there should be an association. And you are probably familiar with uh, genetic associations or uh, odds ratio and say that people that have uh, uh, diabetes uh, have a higher frequency of a certain SNP or a certain HLA. So it's the same thing. So if you respond, the population responds to uh, this peptide, and say this peptide is DR7 restricted, right? I should see that the responses that are mapping to people that express DR7, not necessarily all people that respond to DR7 should respond, but it should be a higher frequency of HLA-DR7 in the responders as compared to the non-responders. Oops. Right. Um, so here, in order for the tool to function, you need to tell the tool what is the HLA typing of your population, of each individual, and tell them, the tool, that uh, individual uh, number one responded to peptide two and eight, and individual number three responded. So the response uh, data. And so this one is an example. So here you have this uh, people, 13 people, and uh, you have the HLA type of this uh, particular uh, set of uh, and then you have this imaginary set of uh, five peptides that was tested and uh, sometimes the data was not available and you see what uh, that this uh, donor one, uh, no, sorry, the peptide number one was recognized by donor number seven, peptide number two was recognized by uh, uh, donor two and so forth. And obviously this is, yes. So, sorry, what are, what are the units there? Is, there? is it treated as binary or responses, or that's the total? Yes, it's binary. Okay. But you, you can, so you can enter the data, and in this particular case is uh, Alice spot data, and so that you do not have to re-enter each time. You can actually change your threshold uh, of what you consider positive or negative. But it's, it's the tool doesn't care. It's binary. <coughs> okay, these are the formulas, uh, and you don't need to really look at the formulas. Let me explain to you what is the logic. So the odds ratio, or, or uh, R, is what is commonly used in classic uh, uh, disease association or genetics, the, and is basically the frequency of people that respond and have that 
divided by the people that do not respond, the frequency of that HLA allele in the people that do not respond. So the problem with ORs for small data uh, sets is that this guy, the frequency in the non-responders can be zero. And as you know, division by zero, it's a problem <coughs> because it's not a value, it's infinite. So in, in both cases, classically what is done is to calculate a different variable, which is re relative to frequency, which is basically the frequency of that HLA in the people that respond divided by the frequency of the HLA in the whole population, which by definition can't be zero because otherwise we would not be discussing <laughs> the fact that as a potential restriction element. Um, so you, in the example, we already entered our HLA frequency and already entered the uh, uh, response rate data. Uh, and uh, you have two uh, different uh, options. One is the rate results and the other is the complete re uh, re uh, report. So uh, the complete report, well, this is the complete report. So what you will get, oh sorry, I neglected to explain this, uh, what is AR plus plus and so on. So A stands for HLA, R stands for respond. So these are the number of people that have uh, this particular HLA and responded to that particular peptide. Then of course you have people that A minus and R plus is people that do not have that HLA but responded to that uh, peptide. The next category would be A plus R minus, so people that have the HLA and do not respond, and finally A minus R minus are people that neither have the HLA nor respond. Um, and so then the tool will calculate the uh, response, uh, the relative frequency of the odd ratios, and will also calculate a, a p-value. I should underline that this values are not Bonferroni corrected. So they're not to be taken seriously in the sense of being statistically uh, uh, significant, which is never reached on this uh, uh, data set, but is a way to restrict the options that you have uh, of what are pos uh, potential restrictions. So here, uh, the complete report lists the whole data set. If you want to see it, be my guest. Uh, however, we also have this rate uh, restricted report, which kind of narrows down uh, the, the output. And how did we narrow down the output? So first of all, sometimes you will have negative values, which for the rate purpose doesn't make sense in the sense that you say that this peptide is never responded in people that have HLA-DR7. You don't want to know that. It's likely a fluke. Uh, and the other thing we did, we went through a set of peptides that we knew what the restriction was, and we uh, confirmed that by tetramers, and, in a, in, and we published that some time ago, and basically asked what is empirically, what R, F value or P value are the best threshold to give you the highest likelihood that your calls are going to be uh, uh, corresponding to true restriction. And so this is uh, what the, the, the tool will give you. And so just to give you uh, maybe walking through an example. So for example, this peptide, right? And the R beta 10101, it's uh, four people that have the R1 responded to this peptide. 
but also eight people that did not have DR1 responded to that peptide. And uh, zero people that had that HLA did not respond to the peptide. And then 38 people did not have that allele and did not respond. So this situation is likely reflective of the fact that DR1 is a restriction element because every single one that had DR1 responded to that peptide. But also you have these other eight that do not uh, have DR1 but also responded, so it's likely that this peptide is promiscuous and has, is DR1 restricted but is also restricted by some other DR1, uh, DR allele or DP or DQ and so forth. Uh, finally, uh, the, the last two I <coughs> just wanted to briefly go over uh, is what was uh, mentioned as this uh, deimmunization tool, uh, which is technically not an analysis tool, but is a more a predictive tool. Um, so why do we care? Why do people care? Uh, and uh, in general, this is a, a, a real big issue, which is uh, linked to the fact that when you inject humans with uh, drugs that are protein, you sometimes have an immune response against the drug. Uh, the drug could be uh, monoclonal antibodies, certainly it's an explosion of drugs that are uh, uh, inhibiting uh, uh, TNF or uh, chemokines or you name it or cytokines, and, or it could be uh, not a monoclonal antibody, but for example, EPO or factor VIII, uh, things that uh, 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 patients may be deficient. So, uh, and this is an, a, a, a serious problem because uh, if you develop antibodies, say that you're treated with Humira, and you develop antibodies against Humira, essentially uh, you become like a, a junkie in the sense that the antibodies will clear the drug and so you need higher and higher doses to get the same effect and eventually it stops working altogether in which case you had to switch to another antibody or whatever but so obviously this is a problem and it gets even worse in cases where you have uh, a, 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 um, something that is not uh, it's not an antibody, but it's a, a normal constituent of the body. You might recall there was a big issue with EPO uh, several years ago. Uh, and EPO was given as a supplement to uh, people that had uh, neutropenia for a variety of different reasons to increase, boost their red, red cell. Uh, and in some cases, an antibody response against EPO ensued. And so not only you did not get your benefit, but you proceeded to actually inhibit your normal production red blood cells. And red cell aplasia can kill you. And in fact, there were some people that were killed. So anyway, enough of that. Uh, so the idea here is if you provide a sequence, then uh, we run a prediction uh, trying to find what are predicted potential dominant epitopes, and then suggest potential substitutions that would decrease uh, the binding of this dominant promiscuous binding region, thereby potentially being of interest to uh, reduce the immunogenicity of a protein. So uh, how does it work? So you put in your sequence and the, uh, uh, the tool will generate uh, overlapping 15 MERS uh, from the protein sequences and then we'll predict HLA class two binding regions. Uh, and so here is an example. And uh, uh, this is a, a median percentile score which was uh, uh, derived looking at data where we had tested complete set of overlapping peptides in patients and we knew which peptide worked and which peptide did not uh, elicit a response. Um, and then the next thing that the tool does is, as I was saying, suggest amino acid substitution predicted to decrease binding. 
And one important thing that makes this exercise uh, less than trivial is the fact that you may introduce a substitution at one position, and that will obliterate the binding, uh, but might actually create perfectly great other binder in the following peptide, because uh, there are multiple frames that are possible. And so you need to really look not only at the fact that uh, uh, you need to hopefully optimally uh, decrease the binding without increasing the binding of the neighbors. Uh, so uh, here, oh, yeah, actually is EPO. No, I forgot that we had EPO in here. Uh, and uh, uh, you set a threshold, then off you go. And so the tool will say, uh, I think that there are four regions that I flag as potentially problematic. And uh, it takes a little bit to run this tool. So uh, you enter your email address, and the, uh, uh, the tool will email you the results when they're ready. So I want to email myself. <coughs> and, uh, and so these are the possible scores. So the first thing you uh, want is uh, for the two neighboring peptides, you want to, uh, you have possible outcomes. So the substitution that you introduced, <clears throat> apart from screwing up the binding of the peptide, uh, did not, the best outcome, did not create any problems, either to the right or to the left. Uh, or uh, this one actually, sorry, it's absent means if you are using a 15-mer or if, this, if the particular peptide is the first or the last uh, uh, peptide in the protein sequence, then there is nothing that you can uh, uh, alter by introducing the substitution. So not to have anything is the best, or to have reduced or neutral, and these are the uh, worst things where you have eliminated one binding region and created two additional ones, which is not really what you want to do. Um, and so this is the uh, output. So you have the peptide <clears throat> and all different uh, single amino acid substitutions with the uh, deimmunization score uh, summarized, and here's the, uh, the peptide and the C-terminal and N-terminal peptides there. And so this, again, is meant as an, uh, a, a, a stepping stone because uh, the effect on reducing uh, predicted HLA binding needs to be reconciled with the fact that your protein drug still needs to be active. I mean, I can <clears throat> tell you how to make something that is guaranteed not to be uh, binding anything. I can put 20 prolins in a row, <laughs> but that protein is probably not going to even fold and certainly is not going to retain the uh, biological activity or the binding of the antibody. So this is, it's a set. And what we envision uh, is that you could run this tool and then you would have to do some medicinal chemistry and say, hey, these are 15 substitutions, and the medicinal chemist will tell you, God, no, <coughs> don't mess with residue X and Y because that's it's right in the uh, active side of the enzyme, but you can probably uh, freely modify this other residue or whatever. And that's it. <laughs> Basically, as a recap uh, of uh, analysis uh, tools, we went through the population coverage to infer what is the coverage provided by a particular peptide in a particular ethnicity or, 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 or world region. Conservancy, uh, how conserved a particular epitope is, uh, a, or set of epitopes in a set of sequence clustering, uh, inferring uh, restrictions, and providing suggestions for reducing immunogenicity of uh, protein drugs. Questions? Yes. 
for the deimmunization tool. Does it always change one amino acid, or can you, if you have a cluster, will it change different or several amino acids? It only uh, um, <coughs> changes one amino acid at a time. So, um, it, because it 20 times 20 becomes, so if you want to look at multiple amino acid substitutions, what we would recommend is uh, to select the ones you're interested in and then run them again. So if you run them again through a tool, we'll then generate all two substitutions, which is a little bit boring, but it's doable. So first you will check if there is a cluster there, just to know if you need to change one amino acid or? Say it again, I so couldn't hear you. First you will che check your sequence if it's a cluster of epitopes, then run the deimmunization tool. What would you recommend? Or would you see would you see it in the tool? Since you would see it in the tool. So, um, oh yes. So here, the tool will say for this particular protein that there are uh, this uh, four different potential uh, peptides that uh, have promiscuous binding and thereby. Uh, are at risk of being immunogenic. And in fact, you see that 96 and 101 are the same peptide, so to speak, overlapping by 10. I don't know if I answered your question. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, hold on. There's Morton, Dan, and then Morton. It's great to be here to hear these fantastic tools. I should know more about them, but I, I don't. So I have a few questions uh, to the population coverage tool, for instance. Uh, so it seems now you have to, to come with your peptides yourself, and then you report back the coverage of those in the given population. But wouldn't another question to be asked is, I have predicted peptides in uh, HIV, and then I want to find the minimal subset of peptides that can cover my population up to a certain percentage. So you kind of use the same kind of logic but to narrow down from a large pool of peptides to the smaller set that, in concert, will give you some coverage? Uh, yes, but no. Uh, <coughs> in the sense, yes, that is a highly desirable thing to do. And again, back in the Epimune years, that's, we were asking, ask that all the time, because uh, I would come with, oh, the I have is 45 super cool epitopes, and the business people will say, Pfft, we don't want to pay for 45 epitopes. What is the minimum set of peptides that you can? And, and that is, unfortunately, it's not linear in the sense that uh, you have to actually calculate all the possible permutation. Because one naive thing would be, you say, I pick the best one, and then I pick the second best one, and the third one. But what may happen is you pick three A2 epitopes and nothing happens. Yeah, but again, that can be solved. There are tools out there that, that have addressed that issue. I think it would be interesting for the IDB to try to incorporate uh, this option. I, I, I agree with you, it would be interesting. I, I, it's uh, computationally a pain in the neck, but then uh, yeah. I may be wrong, and if uh, we can find a way to do it, that certainly that would be totally great. Okay, uh, and my other question goes to the rate uh, algorithm. You don't seem to incorporate any binding, it's just like a, a, a kind of a prevalence of response in the given allele background that is driving this tool, right? And, and, and now as MEC class two binding predictions are starting to become better maybe soon, <laughs> uh, wouldn't it make sense to, to think about improving this by uh, adding in that you, you can of course can do your statistics and finding the alleles that are enriched in the responding cohort compared to the background, but also binding should be there. Right, absolutely. True, uh, let me uh, answer in two different things. One is that we looked at it. In fact, when we were developing RAID, we tried to combine binding, and maybe just because it was back then and now would be different, but it didn't really uh, perform very well, combining binding predictions to the uh, HLA odds ratio calculation. Uh, the other thing that we tried to do and also did not work very well is to uh, factor in for uh, linkage disequilibrium. 
So <clears throat> as you might know, uh, if you say are HLA-DR7, HLA-DR beta 1, or 7 or 1, you also express DR beta 4 or 1 or 1, and they are next to each other on the chromosome, and they are, and so it's very annoying because in most cases, b both will come. Uh, and so we tried to combine different ways to see, and at the end of the day, we gave up. And so rate will tell you this is associated with both DR B1701 or DR beta 40101, and go figure it out yourself. <laughs> uh, I'll stop. Sorry. No, Alice. it's okay. I don't uh, know. The uh, the Sheridan is in charge. Uh, do we have time to keep? Answering more to, okay, where are the, no, sorry. <laughs> Demunization, you also mentioned yourself that not all mutations are equally relevant from, a, from protein perspective, right? And why don't you incorporate that when there are some, you can easily mutate a valine to an, uh, an isoleucine without disrupting anything and that could be implemented, couldn't it, simply in the algorithm? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, to me that is not the main driving force. Uh, in the, what really matters is the, uh, business end, if you wish, of a molecule. So yes, to, uh, to put a valine for an isoleucine, it's likely to be more tolerated than to put a proline for an isoleucine. Uh, however, as you will probably concur, in terms of really screwing up binding, uh, a valine to isoleucine is less likely to have a dramatic effect. So that's really not the way to go from the work we've done in this area, uh, the best thing is to find positions that are relatively ininfluent in the binding of the antibody to its target or, uh, and then really go to town on those <coughs> and change them to, uh, so that's, uh, and that, that is not uh, something that you cannot have in the tool because it's going to be completely different. What is important for EPO and factor eight, it's, it's a different binding site, so it's not. For the rate results, how do we interpret the par for relative, no, for odds radio and uh, p value? So uh, <coughs> the odds ratio or um, response frequency is a uh, ratio of things that have and don't have. Mm -hmm. So an odds ratio of three, it means that that HLA is three times more frequent mm -hmm. in people that respond to that peptide as compared to people that do not. So that's the p-value is a Fisher probability. So to say that this uh, uh, allele is three times more frequent in people that respond that do not, if I tell you that this is uh, based on three people, you might be saying, yeah, okay, possible. Uh, if, however, I say we tested 1,000 people and this was found in 300 people, then the p-value will become much, much lower, just because that statement is much more statistically significant. So the two are, one is the ratio, the other is the statistical probability of that occurring by chance. Uh, in the case of the immunization, I wonder in which part of the antibodies for therapeutic purposes is often the presence of T cell epitopes. Right, so uh, as a general rule is thought that immunogenicity is most uh, uh, frequently encountered in the variable region in the CDR regions, which makes sense because uh, you do not have high concentration of that particular CDR, and all of a sudden you're being injected with milligrams every day of 
So that can be, that is, is actually, it's an assumption that seems so obvious, but it's actually not been necessarily verified uh, as stringently as I would like. Uh, in general, for uh, one thing that the demonization tool does not take into account, because it's a different thing, is that the degree of homology to self is a major factor. And so uh, you can have that something that is uh, uh, self found identical uh, and binds very well will be less immunogenic of something that is a totally foreign substance uh, and sequence that might bind less, but it's gonna be more immunogenic because you're generally tolerant to things that are uh, uh, self. So that is another thing to take into account. Uh, we don't argue with the fact that self similarity is a, also a driver of immuno, uh, immunogenicity, but we don't compute that in this uh, uh, my, my question follows with a joke. <laughs> um, it, these are all versatile, versatile tools. I am learning a lot. So here's a question. You said in the previous talks, help, free, these are all very interesting <laughs> words. I also like it. And uh, personally, I don't like to uh, bug people if I, if I don't make any payment, for example. Right, so when we send some emails seeking for help, do you take seriously to respond to the users like me, number one? Number two, do you provide some sort of service for the users in case if we have to seek your service for a, for a fee, for example? So, uh, if our service is number one, number two, do you take our requests whenever we send the emails seeking your help? seriously to respond to us. Yes, we do take them very seriously. <coughs> that guy over there, Nima, is the one that is uh, coordinating also together with Sheridan answers to, uh, uh, to users' uh, feedback. And don't take my word for it, uh, but just to emphasize the point even uh, more is that we actually do track how uh, many hours or days it takes to resolve a uh, user inquiry because uh, actually uh, we report that to NIAID and so that we uh, want to be able to say that we resolved uh, X percent of uh, users request for help within and actually does anybody know the real So then the other point that you said is the fee for service. We do not provide a fee for service. We, uh, we're proud to be uh, accessible and uh, serve the community. I mean, uh, what has happened, uh, not as a fee for service, uh, but collaboration. Sometimes people have contacted us and say, hey, I'm interested in, uh, I don't know, Japanese encephalitis. Uh, can you collaborate around it? So, but we, but that's, it, something may happen as a wet lab collaboration, has nothing to do for VIDB. VIDB will not charge you a dime uh, and will answer your uh, help request. Obviously within reason, if, if, if you ask, uh, can you please uh, sequence uh, 300 viruses and uh, send me the results, we'll say <laughs> so, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, out of curiosity, do you keep, keep a track of people who could be using your database across the globe you know, for your own growth and potential? We, we do and we do not, ah. in the sense that we do have, we track uh, users uh, in the sense of, uh, in a general level, but we do not uh, spy on you, in the sense we do not say, oh, he, he, he logged in five times today and uh, he was interested in Ebola virus and we, so we, we, there was a conscious decision. We, 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 we try to respect your privacy. Let's put it this way. I don't know if but Bjorn or 
anybody wants okay or can anybody tinker the databases your database you know in terms of security everything since it is a publicly available it's publicly available we don't i know can uh, anybody tinker there, there is an option uh and uh, this is was envisioned especially in the first few years of the uh database if you think back 2003 was right after 911 and the priority of the database was to curate potential bioterrorism or whatever so uh there was an option that was in place in case the government wanted to restrict access or track or whatever uh we had that capability that has never been deployed um. I uh, noticed that, that these um, tools were designed on HLA haplotypes. Do you know how reliable are they for um, other species predictions? Oh, it, it, they, they would have, so. For, I do not believe that the demonization tool uh, would work with uh, 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 with other species because uh, that is not a concern to decrease the immunogenicity of a drug for kangaroos. Uh, but conceptually, if you had a reliable predictor, it could be extended to that. Regarding the rate or population frequency, uh, sure, it, it, the tool doesn't care. You could enter uh, say you have a population of wild rats and they are MHC type rats. If you were enter the uh, MHC type of your rats and you had the uh, knowledge of which rat responds to which peptide, you would get exactly the same. The tool would work totally, both in population coverage and in uh, 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 what else was I saying? Yeah. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, cluster and sequence conservancy are not HLA related. Uh, so the tool, yes, would work for other species. All right. Thank you. Sorry. They want to say that the, 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 the prediction tools for, for MAC binding, uh, at least for class one, work from, from, for, I mean, not for all species, but for, for mouse, uh, cattle, swine, uh, uh, they I mean, the, the livestock animals are covered to a high degree by those with accuracies comparable to humans. Class one. Class two. It's coming, not yet. There's no, not much data around to train on for class two yet. Uh, but I think for, at least for cattle, class two will come in the next year and then the other guys might follow along. I don't know about primates for class two, I don't remember. Oh yeah, it. don't go to primates for class two. I mean, they, <clears throat> so I don't know if anybody cares, but uh, with the, uh, so you know that humans have HLA-DR beta one and then beta three, four, and five, right? And those are gene duplication events. Uh, macaques, for some weird reason, have this to the wazoo. So you type a macaque, they can have 50 different loci duplicated or none at all. So as a result of that, HLA, uh, no HLA, uh, MHC typing for macaques class two, it's an absolute uh, uh, nightmare. So uh, 